following the events that are happening in Ukraine lately, uh, a lot going on there, a lot we don't understand. Uh, I guess the, the Russian upper house has authorized military use in, in the Ukraine. I know some say the Ukrainians are 60% Russian and uh, the rest are would be opposed to an alliance with Russia. And I, I can't read into the mind of Vladimir Putin to determine whether he's doing what's right or wrong, and I, I'm in no position to judge the man. But we do know this about the Ukraine. Uh, the Ukraine is a, uh, is a Christian country. Uh, it was the, the Antioch of its time. Uh, it, it was the sending church. Uh, it's, it's the Bible Belt of all the Slavic nations. It's a crossroads between the East and the West, an important strategic area for the advancement of the Gospel. And for the last 130 years or so, it's been persecuted. And then when the, uh, the Soviet Union broke up, uh, Christianity flourished again in the Ukraine. Pentecostals, uh, Evangelicals, Orthodox people, uh, all of Christianity began to flourish when the Soviet Union broke up. And one wonders what's going to happen now if the Soviet Union gets involved with the Ukraine again. And uh, I don't know what would happen, but there's one thing that we need to keep in mind, uh, that God frowns on people that would persecute his church. This morning we're going to continue in the book of Esther chapter 6 of the book of Esther. Now if you remember the story of Esther, a man by the name of Mordecai and his young cousin Esther have been left behind after the Babylonian exile and then when the Persians defeated the Babylonians they were still left in Persia. So these are Jewish people that are left living in Persia. Uh, King uh, Xerxes divorces his wife and they have a beauty contest to see who's going to replace her as queen. Uh, Esther rises to the occasion. She, she wins the beauty contest. She becomes the queen. She appoints her cousin Mordecai to a position as a judge near the, near the gates of the city. Now, there's another man in the story by the name of Haman. Haman is uh, second to the king in power in Persia. We don't know how he got to that position, but he's been elevated to the position of power right next to the king. He demands that people worship him wherever he goes, at least bow down and show respect. Mordecai the Jew, for whatever reason, decides that he's not going to bow down to Haman. So Haman, as we saw last week, takes it upon himself to uh, build this uh, gallows in order to hang Mordecai for not showing him enough respect. And remember, probably not hanging, it's more the idea of him hailing Mordecai in the tradition of the Persian people. So that's where we left off last week. So let's pick it up at uh, verse 1, chapter 6. That night, the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bignatha and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this, the king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, who is this, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had erected for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Father, we praise you and thank you for your holy and righteous word this morning. Father, we pray that as we uh, wrestle with the text, Lord, that uh, you would open up our eyes and ears and hearts and minds to what your word says to us this morning. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, Zechariah says this, don't despise the day of small things. Well, Zechariah is writing at that time uh, about the rebuilding of the temple. And if the, the, the ancients remember the Solomonic Temple and how beautiful and just how grand it was, and the beginning of the rebuilding of that temple. Remember, the temple was destroyed in 
586 B.C., when the Babylonians came down, where well, they're going to rebuild the temple now. And it's not going to be as great as the other temple, and it's just we're done with man uh, just slowly building this temple. And uh, a lot of people think that, you know, they, you, you want grand, magnificent cathedrals, and we, we look upon something like Brick by Brick Bible Church, and you compare it to the grand cathedrals of Europe, and what value is this church? But God specializes in the insignificant things, doesn't he? How did he start the uh, nation of Israel? A little baby born to an Israeli woman or a Hebrew woman who's taken over by a, the daughter of the Pharaoh. How does he start Christianity? A little baby born in Bethlehem. So God is interested in the small, insignificant things, the coincidences of life. The verse 1 says, that night, that night, what night is he talking about? Well, the night that Haman is plotting to execute Mordecai. That same night, a coincidence, uh, that same night, uh, Xerxes, the king, can't sleep. You ever had insomnia? It's horrible. It's just, you sleep awake all night. I remember one of my professors in Dallas, uh, Dr. Paul Meyer of the Meyer Mineral Clinic in Dallas, uh, he recommended that uh, when, when you can't sleep, when you got insomnia, uh, force yourself to stay awake. It's like reverse psychology, and you'll fall asleep. Another thing he said was just when, when you can't sleep, write down the things that are bothering you. And I do that. When I lay awake at night, I can't, I, I can't sleep. I'll just get up in the middle of the night, just write down everything that's bothering me and how I can overcome those problems. Well, we, we have different ways of dealing with, with insomnia. And one of the ways that people deal with it is to just find something boring to read. So, so, so Xerxes can't sleep that night, and he, so he calls his attendants to bring in all the chronicles of his reign. Now, according to what we can uh, see chronologically, he's been in power some 12 years. So I don't know what that entails, but it's probably a lot of chronicles for the last 12 years. It's like trying to write, read the congressional record. If you've tried to ever read the congressional record, that might very well put you to sleep. So he has the the attendants read him all the chronicles from the last 12 years. But what chronicles is he reading? Coincidentally, he's reading about Mordecai and what Mordecai has done for him uh, to stop this assassination. So he, so he asks his attendants, well, what has been done for Mordecai? And the attendants don't know. He says, well, we've, we've got to do something. And then coincidentally, Haman the man that wants to execute Mordecai is approaching the king's gate. Insignificant details, but they, they're, they're, they're a great coincidence. So Mordecai comes up to the gate. When Xerxes wants to honor Mordecai for what he's done. You know, God's interested in, 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 in the insignificant little details of our life. You know, last week, I received a letter from the IRS. Have you ever received, received a letter from the IRS? It's not a good feeling. You, you, you look at it and go, well, this, this, this doesn't bode well. And sure enough, I open it up and it, it's got some, some, some letter in there saying, I know this is astronomical amount of money that I owe the IRS. Now it's a mistake, and I've got the documentation to prove that it's a mistake, and, and I'm, I'm going to be all right. So, my, so I got my, my heart back, back in, in good shape, and it's, it's beating again finally. But, 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 but I wonder about this, uh, the, the fear that they have on you, and, uh, and, and I wonder about how the IRS is spending money. And I was reading a story about Uganda, that the Americans give $400 million of aid to the, the people of Uganda every year, and they're thinking, well, we're not going to give it this year because we don't like the way they're treating homosexuals in Uganda. So we're thinking maybe we're not going to give them $400 million. And then I'm thinking about what's going on in the Ukraine, and the American government is uh, sending out, issuing bonds in order to uh, subsidize the Ukrainian oil and subsidize all their, their, their events. And I'm saying to myself, they're giving away all this money and they're persecuting me for this little bit of money? <clears throat> the first thing that comes into my mind is, man, we got to get even with these people. <laughs> we, 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 we can cheat people. We can cheat the IRS. I mean, the, the whole IRS system is built upon faith and trust in the American people. And if you really want to cheat the IRS, you surely can. So that's the first thing that comes into your mind. It's like, let's, let's, let's cheat the IRS. Let's, 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 let's cheat. But why don't we? Book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 10 says this. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and your love. God 
knows about the insignificant things in your life. All those bad things are going, and, are going on and, and how you're going to react. And Jesus says in, in the Sermon on the Mount, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And you're, you're told to be obedient to the government. You don't cheat, you don't lie, you don't steal, no matter what, how anybody is abusing you. Because God will honor that. And that's what's going on here in this story. God doesn't forget the small insignificant details. Mordecai has helped this king. He's saved this king's life. There were two men in, in, that, that, that are involved. They're, they're the chamberlains uh, of, uh, of King Xerxes. I don't know what exactly they do, but they're officials and they take care of his private needs and whatnot. Uh, but, but for some reason, one of them names is Bigtatha and the other is uh, Teresh. And uh, they want to assassinate. Now, who would want to assassinate a wonderful guy like King Xerxes? Well, we've talked about him the last few weeks. That this man is megalomaniacal. He's executed people. He's, he's hurt people. He's, he's, he's an insanely evil man. But these guys decide that they want to execute him, to get rid of him. And uh, Mordecai uncovers the plot. Remember, Mordecai has been elevated to the point where he's a judge at the king's gate. He's overhearing a lot of the, of, of a lot of the commerce that's going on in the city. And he overhears these guys. He tells this to Xerxes' is attendants. Xerxes finds about it. Bigtha and Tirish Tir are, are, are executed, and Mordecai is 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 un, is not honored at this time. But God sees this detail and decides to honor him at this time. So Xerxes reads about him, and he's going to honor him. Let's pick it up in uh, verse six again. About how he's going to honor him. Now Haman thought to himself. Who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he answered the king, For the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe that the king has worn and a horse that the king has ridden, uh, one with a royal dress placed on his head. Then let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor and meet him than the horse through the city gates, proclaiming before him, This is what is done for the man the king the lights to honor. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for the Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led, led him on horseback throughout the city, streets proclaiming before him. This is what is done for the king, for the man the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisors and his wife Zeresh said to him, Since Mordecai, before whom you, your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were all still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. You see, God takes insignificant incidences, coincidence, and brings out or accomplishes his perfect will. You ever wonder about what it's like to be an atheist? There's no God. The Bible's not true. There's no Jesus. Jesus is a liar and a fraud. And uh, all we have left here is this, this, this great cosmic accident. Well, if that's what you believe, how do you, what do you find fulfillment in life? Where, where does your pleasure come from? Well, it could come from pleasing yourself. Uh, everything from sex, drugs, rock and roll. And we, we see it in people. We, we see drug use more and more. For some reason, the, the price of heroin has come down. It used to be $150 an ounce. Now it's like $5 an ounce. And so people are using more and more heroin. People are using more and more things to give them physical pleasure. And that's what you're left with if, if there's no God. The other thing you're left with is, is materialism. Uh, how much can I accumulate in life? How many good things can I, how much money can I, can I, can I accumulate before I die? Or another way of, uh, of dealing with it is just uh, how much glory, how much honor can I have in this world? How many people can look up to me and think about how wonderful I am? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the pride of life. Haman's problem is the pride of life. He wants everybody to look up to him to worship him. So when the king says, what are we going to do for this Mordecai guy who saved my life? How can we honor him? Haman, what would you do? 
Well, first thing that's going through Haman's mind is, uh, he's talking about me. He, he's talking about me. So he comes up with this idea that, well, let's get one of the king's robes and, and, and let him wear that. And then let him ride one of the king's horses with a crown on top of the horse. Incidentally, people look at that and they kind of laugh at the idea of a crown on top of a horse, but they found reliefs in the, in the Middle East with, with pictures of, 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 of horses with, with a crown on them. But at any rate, give that to the man and, and, and he will be exalted. He will be honored for what he's done for you. Xerxes looks at Haman and says, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's go for it, Haman. Only it's Mordecai we're talking about. Imagine what's going through Haman's mind right now. Haman, the man that wants to be exalted by everybody, there's one man that does it, it's Mordecai, and here he is now. He's got to bring the clothes, bring the horse, and lead Mordecai throughout the city, declaring that everywhere that Mordecai goes, this is what happens to the man that honors the gate. How humiliating, how mortifying for Haman. That would be the lowest point of his life. Mordecai goes back to the, uh, the gate to judge, but Haman returns home to Xerxes and his advisors. He's mortified. He, he puts cloth over his head. We remember how we, we talked about the Jewish people when they mourn, they wear the sackcloth of, of goat hairs and uh, they throw ashes on themselves, which looks like an absurd sight to us. This isn't as, as absurd, but it still looks a little silly. He's walking around with, with the cloth on his head, mourning and complaining about what's happened. You see, that's God's perfect plan. Remember we talked about it in James last week, that uh, God exalts the humble, but opposes the arrogant or proud. That's what James says. Oh, we see the same thing in 1 Peter 5, 5. God exalts the humble, but opposes the the proud. Why do we keep seeing in this? Why do we keep seeing that in the scriptures? Because God opposes the proud and exalts the humble. That's part of His plan, and He fulfills that plan in this passage. The other idea that's fulfilled in this passage is that God's plan is to protect His people. Uh, someone once said that, uh, "What's the greatest evidence?" for the existence of God, to which someone else replied, it's the Jew. The Jew is the greatest evidence for the existence of God. Now, I don't know who said it. That's been attributed to Benjamin Disraeli uh, speaking with Queen Victoria. It's also been attributed to Blaise Pascal uh, speaking with King uh, Louis XIV. But nevertheless, there, there's absolute truth in it that God protects his people. Th that protection can be seen. Oh, we see it in the Jewish people almost everywhere. They flourish no matter what culture or what society they're in. Uh, no matter how many people try to drive out the Jewish people, whether it's Adolf Hitler or the Spanish people or the English or whoever starts persecuting Jews, they seem to thrive. They seem to do well. And they have this incredible uh, statistic about how many Jews have won Nobel Prizes. It's, it's, it's unbelievable when like 41% 40, of all the Nobel Prizes from this, this one group of people that don't even make up 1% of the world's population, they flourish. They flourish. We, we can see it. But what, 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 what Zeresh and his advisors are saying is basically the same thing. Don't mess with the Jews. And, and, and they, they, they've heard tell of it. Uh, we've heard tell of, of, of the book of Genesis Genesis chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, where God says to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. Those that bless you, I will bless, and those that curse you, I will curse. And they hear tell of how the Egyptians oppose the Jewish people, and the Egyptians are annihilated. They hear tell of the Canaanites, and what happens to the Canaanites that oppose the Jewish people? What happens to the Amalekites when they oppose the Jews? What happens to the Philistines? when they oppose the Jewish people. What happens to the Babylonians and Syria? They know all this. So what they say to Haman is, man, you messed up. Your problem started when you started persecuting the Jewish people. And, and, and what God 
God is doing here is he's, he's presenting a, a, a stage, a play to go on that's going to demonstrate his power that he will protect the Jewish people. He's not going to uh, annihilate them. And so, bad day for Mordecai, or bad day for Haman. Uh, he's been humbled because of his relationship with Mordecai, what he has to do for him. Uh, humbled by his wife and the advisors that he shouldn't have messed around with these Jewish people. But Mordecai's got one good thing going for him, doesn't he? They're taking him away to the banquet. He's going to a banquet next week or tomorrow. And so the, the, the king's attendants come and they take him away to go to the banquet. And this wonderful banquet with Xerxes and Esther. It's going to be a grand time. He's had a lot of bad things happen today, but he's going to go to the banquet. And we'll see what happens next week at this banquet. The question is, what do we get out of this ourselves? What spiritual principles can we learn from this passage? I remember reading a story by, from Chuck Swindoll about a man by the name of Johnson. And Johnson's one of these guys that uh, can't do anything right. You know what I mean? You go into the supermarket, and there's two lines. The one you get into, that's the wrong one. That's the one that's going to be the longest. Or, or, or he'll go into an elevator, and uh, he'll choose one elevator, and that's the one that gets stuck. You know, he'll bet on a baseball game, and you can bet for sure that the team he chooses is going to lose. Everything this guy does in his life is wrong. Every time he tries to make a choice, it's the wrong choice. Well, as luck would have it, uh, because of his business, he has to go to a city that's like a thousand miles away. And because of the time constraints, he has to take a plane. So he's saying to himself, oh, man, a plane. I know whichever plane I take, that's the one that's going to go down. And so it's just everything goes wrong for this guy. He's always making the wrong choice. But good news. There's only one plane that flies into that city, that distant city. He doesn't have to make a choice. So he's, still, he's finally happy. This is the first time in my life that I'm not going to make the wrong choice. So he gets on the plane. And sure enough, 30 minutes into the flight, he looks out on the wing. And there's a fire on the engine. The end, the plane is going down. And like a good Catholic, he cries out to his favorite saint, Saint Francis, save me! Almost immediately, a hand comes out of the sky, scoops him out of that plane, and as that plane is descending to the earth, he's held some two, three hundred feet over the earth. And a voice cries out, I can save you if you have truly called on me. Yes, St. Francis, I have. A lot of bad things have happened to me in my life. It always seems like everything is going wrong, but no matter what went wrong, I always acted with dignity and grace. Yes, St. Francis, I truly called upon you. To which the voice cried out, oh, St. Francis, of Assisi or St. Francis Xavier. <laughs> but then that lot, lot like life, a lot of those insignificant things are going wrong. There's times when nothing seems to go right with life. God is aware of all the little things that are going wrong. He's aware of each and every one of our little problems. The other thing that we learn from the text, the other principle is that God honors us. He will not forget all those little things that have happened in our lives when we have acted with faith. Just as he honored Mordecai in this passage, he honors us. He will never forget all the things that we have done during those <laughs> difficult times in life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your uh, word today. We thank you for the encouragement that we see in the, the life of Mordecai. And, uh, Father, how you uh, exalt those that humble themselves and you oppose those that are proud. Father, may we learn these lessons today, Lord, that uh, no matter how many bad things might happen in our life and how many bad choices we make, Lord, the Lord will be act in faith. You indeed will honor us. Father, we thank you for that. In the precious name of the Savior, amen. Amen.
Amen. Got anybody? Got any prayer?